Yeah, thank you, Scott. I feel I've worshipped and um, we've... Have you worshipped today? Worshipped our God? Because uh, that means we can go then. You don't need to, to, to listen to, to me. Um, it is nice to be here. I kind of consider this church one of my home churches because when I was 10 years old, I was not a baptised member, but I was a founding member of this congregation. And when my parents were living here in the 80s and 90s, this was their congregation. And it is my sister and her family's congregation. But all but Reuben are here today. <laughs> are not here today, I mean. Um, Pathfinder camps, and I saw a whole lot of people somewhat enthusiastic last evening in the car park, sort of leave and, uh, for a survivor camp. Um, I know where I'd rather be, um, and uh, I'm here. So, uh, yeah, but not Nick and Reuben and a whole lot of, not Reuben, uh, Max, and a whole lot of, whole lot of others. Um, but good on you for being involved in whole, whole lots of ministry. And, um, yeah, I see your, your pastor is a Greek Orthodox priest or a Jewish rabbi. Or, um, yeah, well, one of them. And uh, the other one, the last time I was with uh, the, the Brunts was up on the central coast uh, when they were pastoring up there and they had no kids. And now they've got two. So, yeah, things kind of change, which is, which is really, really good. Um, yeah, greetings from the South Pacific Division. Today, around the South Pacific Division, we don't know how many worshipping groups we have. But we do know that we have over 6,000 organised churches. And um, certainly throughout the Pacific, there's a whole lot more than, than that. And I bring greetings from my fellow officers. Um, Francois Keat is our CFO, originally from South Africa. And Mike Sukuri is originally from Rotuma in Fiji. Um, and he is the, the secretary. And um, all in different parts of our division, which has a vision of becoming a thriving Adventist movement, living our hope in Jesus and transforming the Pacific. And I'll tell you some of those things that are happening. But it's interesting, and Paul, thanks for um, mentioning in your welcome the 160th anniversary of us actually becoming a Seventh-day Adventist church. That was a big thing because our pioneers didn't like organisational structure. Have you ever heard of that in the young people today and people that you kind of connect with? I don't mind Jesus, but I'm not into this organised religion. Well, we struggled with that from our heritage. Um, but we organised for mission. And that's what our, our um, focus is. And I wonder if you'll say the World Seventh-day Adventist mission uh, with me. Are you ready? One, two. Make disciples of Jesus Christ who live as his loving witnesses and proclaim the all people the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages in preparation for his soon return. That is what we are celebrating 160 years of, that kind of focus. Helping others to know the goodness of God and his last day message before he comes, comes back. And because we live in Australia, we are a registered charity and the Charity Commission wants us to per, um, report on purpose. And so we have a purpose statement as, as well. And the church's strategy these uh, five years is called I Will Go. And we have our strategy as well, which is all part of that. And basically it is to 
help people in the process of coming to know Jesus and growing in him as a disciple. Because a disciple of Jesus is someone in every way becoming more like him. Do you like that? I, I want to become more like Jesus, my, my saviour and, and Lord. And I think if most people are like Jesus, and as I said before, plenty of people don't mind Jesus. They just don't like the package it comes with in sometimes. And that's a challenge for us. Are we the right kind of package? Just uh, a couple of stories. It, health offering today. And I'm in the health department building in Fiji, Suva. And uh, the former Fiji health minister, because they've changed government, and his permanent secretary, on behalf of the World Health Organization, and there is uh, a lady there from the World Health Organization as well, and Pastor Maveni Kalfanonga, who is the president, he's right on the extreme of the, the union there, George Kwong and I received from the World Health Organization two awards for 2021-2022, the COVID years, that the best health intervention program in the South Pacific was the 10,000 Toes program, which our church um, operates. In the South Pacific, every 20 minutes, so we've been worshipping here for 40 minutes, two people have lost a limb in the Pacific. Because that's what happens on average. Um, and that's pretty sad. But we're making in head roads. Now, this is at the Tamavua Church, and these people have just graduated from the Live More Abundantly program, which is an intervention and a health intervention to deal with lifestyle diseases. One of the ladies there is a general practitioner. She was struggling with all of the people coming to her and not knowing how to help them with type 2 diabetes because the medicine wasn't working. She had an Adventist friend who said, why don't you check out our health um, resources? And she did, and she discovered that by putting them into practice herself, she felt better, and then she was able to um, encourage her patients to be a part of it, and some of them are there. She is there and because she was so enamoured with our health principles that actually change people's lives, she has become a Seventh-day Adventist. That is happening all over the Pacific. This is one of the new 10,000 Toes clinics in Nandi, Fiji. Um, I am being welcomed and opening one of the church's wellness clinics. And each local church are running their own um, health clinics, which is really quite um, amazing. And this is one of the, the ones with their good, healthy food there. And they operate health tests, very simple health tests. And then if they see that people need help, they send them to the doctors, to the hospital. And if they need intervention, they will talk about the programs that they can actually run. And I'm in the main village of Nandi, Fiji. 76 people of this thousand-member village have gra just graduated from the Live More Abundantly program. I'm sitting next to the chief during all of the speeches and... I, they were doing the speeches in Fijian and I've forgotten most of the Fijian I knew and he was speaking to me in English the whole time and he was saying, Tala Tala, you would not believe what's happened to our village and to me myself. Before I could hardly walk, I was all a lot of pain in my body and now I can walk upright and I can do my 10,000 steps. I feel amazing. Amazing. 
I used to have indigestion after every meal. I have no longer have indigestion. I had trouble sleeping at night. I now know have, do not have trouble sleeping at night. And it's because of this 10,000 toes. He said, you Adventists, you are welcome in my village any time to run anything. Because of what you have done, you are changing uh, our lives. And it's amazing. They now in Fiji are producing cold press juices with recipes that deal with type 2 diabetes and they are, dis they are going as well as sanitarium in their, um, in their sales and every sale is either 5 or 10 cents goes to helping the 10,000 Toes um, program. And I'm in the Nandi English Church and you can see this is their wellness hub and I don't know if you can see the, the people there but um, they're mainly ladies and they're mainly Indo-Fijian. Now, the church in, well, the, in Fiji, 40% of the population are Indo-Fijian. In the Adventist church, 3% are Indo-Fijian. And this year, in, their focus is to go to their neighbour. I will go, general conference strategy, to my neighbour... And every church in Fiji, whether it's Fijian, Rituman, or um, English-speaking, Hindi-speaking, um, are all going to reach Indo-Fijians. And the two ways that they're discovering that are working best is simply praying for people. Amazing, because the, the people there have hundreds of gods, thousands of them, and they don't know which god to pray to, and sometimes they don't seem to think it works. But if Christians and Adventists come along and pray, and God intervenes, and he often does, they kind of go, wow, your god is powerful. And that's having a big impact. And the second thing is health. And these ladies, they told me, this is our church. Now, I, was, I struggled with that because all of them had fresh red dots on their forehead, which tells me they'd just gone, worshipped Hindu gods. But they said, this is our church because you teach us how to be healthy. You have no idea how much weight I have lost. They said, you have no, no idea how, how my, my family is so much healthier and happier and how the better food and lifestyle is affecting our, our actual Indian settlement, which is not far uh, from this area. In that way, we are really having a huge impact around the South Pacific. And we have seven governments who are actually using the 10,000 toes as a number one resource to deal with type 2 diabetes. Um, and so you just say, hey, God, you're doing a great thing. And so your offering today was to help that, and particularly lifestyle medicine all throughout the South Pacific um, division. But today... Um, your pastor, Dan, asked me to talk about, um, well, he didn't ask me to talk about this, but he told me your theme that you were, were working on. And I thought, hmm, I'd done some study on what Australians and, in fact, English speakers use the word oikos. But if you actually, it's a Greek word, and if you were Greek, and Josh, you've got that heritage, you would hopefully know that it's actually ekos. And what is ekos? What is oikos? And we're going to look at the power of relationships and influence. So I hope you can come with me. We'll do a little bit of a Bible study. We'll, we'll mainly stay in the, the book of Acts. But I do want us to go first to uh, Luke, which 
Um, Luke wrote Acts as well. So if you can come to chapter 10 of, of Luke and verses 6 and 7, I believe Jesus was um, giving his disciples a real challenge. They were all young men. And he, he says, I want you to go out and do what I do, but you're not going to take anything with you. And it's like, you know, the great race. And you've just got to get from A to B and you've got to do what, what I want you to do. And he says in verse 6, And if a son of peace is there when you're going out and around, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give you, for the labour is worthy of his wages, and do not go from house to house. He says, if you find a person of peace, what is a person of peace? Well, it's the person that would greet you and allow you into the community. And that person would be a person of influence, a person of um, status, of standing. Because, for example, in the Pacific, you, you really are not a part of the village, even as a guest, until the chief or his elders that he has assigned welcomes you. And so Jesus is saying, you're going into all of these villages... Don't just go to anybody else's place. Find the person of peace. And if that person of influence, of status, of leadership, if he or she allows you in, you stay there in that house. Don't move because out of that relationship, you will have influence over the rest of the village. And you kind of go, okay, in communal societies, you kind of get that. But are there people of peace and people of influence in our societies? Would a GP, a Lord Mayor, high school principal, school principal, who are the people of influence who influence other people and their perceptions in a particular community. And Jesus is saying the gospel needs to go to those kind of people first because then you will have bigger impact. Interesting. So how does this work out in the book of Acts? Well, and what is this oikos all about, or ekos? So come to Acts chapter 2. And this is, this is one of the, the places where the actual Greek word is, is used. So Acts chapter 10 and verse 2, and it says, A devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. And this is talking about Cornelius. And he is a Roman centurion. He has a, a regiment. It's the Italian re regiment. And it says of Cornelius that he and his whole oikos... Or ekos, it is the household feared God and followed um, him as the leader of that, that household. Now, who is in the household? Ja uh, Acts actually tells us. So if you just come down to verse um, 6, uh, sorry, verse... verse um, Uh, where is it? Verse verse four. Um, no, it's not. I'm re I'm using a different Bible than I used um, earlier in the week when I was going through it, and I cannot find it. Oh, here we go. Verse seven. 
And the, when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a de- devout soldier. Do you see that? So what is, who is part of the oikos? It would suggest here that it's two, it's servants, it's soldiers. And then later in the chapter, in verse 20. Four, it says, and the following day, when Peter comes to them and shares the gospel, Cornelius was waiting for them, and he called together his relatives and close friends. Wow. So it's got servants, work people, colleagues, the soldier, close relatives, relatives, and friends are all part of what this oikos is. And what happens? That when Peter comes, and he wasn't real keen to go because Cornelius is a Gentile, And they do different things. And you go into a Gentile's house, other people will think you are unclean. And he's not going just into one. But he's going into a whole group and network of people. And he's going, you know, this is going to spread. People will know that I as a a, a Jew, a Jew and a Christian leader are contaminated. But God gave a vision and said, no, I want you to go into this whole household, this whole network of people. Because the gospel needs to have impact. And it did have impact because the spirit came upon them when they heard about Jesus. And they spoke in tongues or other languages just like they did in Acts chapter 2 where it happens for the Jews and here it happens for the Gentiles. And there's this whole network. But that's not the only example. Another one. Acts chapter 16. Let's just go go over to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And here Paul... So the first one was Peter, but here now Paul is uh, on a missionary journey and he's come to Philippi and it says on the Sabbath that he goes out to the river where he believes he will find a place of prayer because there's no synagogue in Philippi because he normally goes to the synagogue. And there he finds a whole lot of women and one of the women's name is Lydia. And she is a businesswoman. And it says there in chapter 16 and verse 15, after they had worshipped, and, and when she and her household were baptised, she begged them to stay in her house. It was her and her oikos. It would have been her employees. It would have been her salespeople. It would have been her, her, her people who, who did the dyeing and the making of the, the, um, all of the, the cloth that she, she had. And her family, this was her oikos. And all of them, the household, became believers and followers of Jesus. Already worshippers, because they kept the, the Sabbath but now knowing the Messiah. But as Paul is doing his ministry, there's a girl wandering around Philippi saying, oh, this, this, these people, they're, they're followers of the Most High God and uh, you know, they, they're teaching you the truth. And, and this, this woman was an absolutely annoying because she was demon possessed and she knew that Paul was teaching about Jesus because the demons know that and so he said get out I want people to make their own mind up I don't want demon influence on who 
Jesus is and the message. So then he gets put into jail because the owners of this girl don't like it. And he's in jail. They get beaten. They sing all night. I suppose that's one thing to do. Um, And then there's an earthquake. Prisons break open. The jailer wants to kill himself because he thinks everybody has left, all the prisoners have left. And Paul says, don't bother doing that. We're all here. And um, he explains to him about Jesus. And in chapter 16 and verse 31, it says, So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. And if you drop down to verse 34, Now when he brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God, with all of his household. All of his ekos, or oikos. In fact, Australia has an oikos movement. And a former pastor of One Turner Church, Phil Brown, is the leader of of that, living out um, Bansdale Way. (coughs) Excuse me. But here, Paul, we think Paul established the church in Philippi, which he did, but he actually established two churches. One was the household of Lydia and the other one was the household of the jailer because the jailer was a Roman. They were completely different, completely different networks and people. And you see, that's how the gospel spreads. And then the last example that we, we have here in Acts chapter eight, uh, is in Acts chapter 18, and this time it, it is in Corinth. And here Paul does go into the synagogue to preach about Jesus. That's the message. And many people believe, but some of the Jews don't like it and they expel him. But then verse 8 it says, Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptised. And here again, it is the oikos or the household. So putting it all together, this word is translated household it means family but it means more than that it include it can include servants employees and relatives family a whole network of people and the new testament actually uses the word quite a lot for church and here are the various households and it even includes Caesar's household in Rome had a network of Christians within Caesar's palace quite amazing isn't it and how do we know it's definitely the church Because if you go to Titus chapter 1 and verse 7, the overseer or the elder manages God's household or oikos. And that is God's church. And then it lists the characteristics of what all that is. This is a cathedral. It's a Seventh-day Adventist cathedral. It is in a city of China. It has been closed down. On a Sabbath, they would have more than a 1,000, sometimes up to 3,000 adults because it is illegal 
for anyone under 18 to go to a public church. But in the last few months, this church has been closed. Its pastor has not been seen for six months. They don't know whether she, and she's an ordained Seventh-day Adventist pastor, whether she's gone underground, which she has done many times in her life, whether she's in prison or whether she is dead. This is one of her trainees. She has trained over... 2,000 pastors in the last 20 years have seen more than uh, 20,000 people become Seventh-day Adventists and has a network of churches all around the area, Seventh-day Adventist churches, which have all been closed. This one was closed when I visited a few years ago. We met with the people and they, we said, did you worship on Sabbath? Yes, we did. Where did you do it? In our homes and in, our, in parks and um, in other places. But you came and met us at the building. Yeah, well, we're outside. We're not inside. We're okay. And we didn't worship in the building. And this is another uh, place or the church. And you can only probably see that because there is, and it's an Adventist one with a little cross. Um, as we were going there, um, they said, you, you as tourists are not supposed to be in this area. There are cameras everywhere in China. And um, we had to sit in the middle of the van and close all of the curtains so the, with, there would be no facial recognition because that's how they, they work it there. And talking with the pastors in, in those areas, and 60% of the pastors in China are women, and I asked the men, why is that? And they, they said, because they usually have more courage than us. Um, and I'm just telling you what men said um, there. And I, I said, but, you know, the government is closing, and, and that was, I was there 219. This, as I said, in the last, in the last 12 months, they've closed over 1,500 Seventh-day Adventist churches in China now. It's not just Seventh-day Adventist churches that are being ch closed. Um, and they say, and I say, you know, well, you know, what does that do? And they said, that's okay. It actually helps us grow faster because instead of coming to a building, they meet in their apartments, in their village homes, in in wherever, and through their oikos, their network. They establish, and they say on average, they'll close a church and when they allow us to come back and, and formalise, we will probably have three more churches. In Australia, here, Faith FM is another ministry that is, is meeting and working with networks of people. It's people who don't like commercial television and radio um, or the government radio and say, you know, we are being told a certain thing to believe and everything is biased and, hey, that's the truth, it is. We want to listen to what the community says and these are community radios and they're having real influence. The last two churches that I have been to, people have been there because of Faith FM and the network that they are creating. In the 21st century, a sociologist whose name I have just for forgotten in uh, 1995, I think it was, did a study and he said that we in, in the West live in three places. We have our home, we have, which is the first place. We have our workplace, which is a second place. And we have the third place, which is other places. And the home is private, but it is hierarchical. 
You have those who are hosts and those who are guests, but it is a place of warmth and love and care and accepting. Workplace, again, is hierarchical. We have bosses and then we have, you know, different levels of management, um, usually. And it's pro productivity focused. You've got to do what you've got to do. And it should be a safe place, but it is quite formal. But it's a place where there is network and relationship. And then there is the other. And that could be a pub a gym, a cafe, a park, a school, and the original throughout history, third place was the church, where everybody was equal and everybody was cared for as one. And that understanding of history goes all the way back to the book of Acts and, what, and Jesus. And what he was saying is that you develop your relationships through your oikos or your household. And some of those relationships can be through your home, can be through your work, but can be in another place. And as a church, if we are going to have an impact, we have to be that third place again. And as I look at what you are looking at, there's a lot of opportunities to be part of a third place. And I want to commend you because all of these can be their own oikos, network of influence. If you allow and at what every network of influence and oikos in the, old, uh, in the New Testament was, a place that honoured Jesus Christ. Some of you will know of the remember the, the shootings of an Australian in mosques in Christchurch. These are some of the widows um, and some of the, the men of the mosques with Seventh-day Adventist pastors in Christchurch, just taken a month ago. Because one of the pastors who's right at the back grew up in Pakistan as a Christian, but Pakistan is a very largely Muslim country and was pastoring in Christchurch and said, I'm not afraid of Muslims. I'm used to Muslims. And was among, the Adventists were the f amongst the first to go there and to offer support and help to all of those who had incredible grief and loss because of the shootings. And now we have an Adventist Muslim friendship group, and this is some of the people, and we're developing a network of understanding and discussion on the Quran and, and, and the Bible because, and, 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 you know, a whole new network or oikos is being developed right now because of that kind of ministry. To finish, I just want to share a few stories from Papua New Guinea. In March 2020, when COVID restrictions hit Papua New Guinea, it wasn't like Victoria, and I think most of the world was glad it wasn't like Victoria. Being a communal um, society, they said all churches had to close, but you could meet with up to 10 people. 
This group of people started with eight people in March 2020, and I was there the end of last year, and you can see how many people have, have come to join what they call their small group. I'm standing between a businessman and his wife. That is their house in the background. You can see that everybody is wearing orange because they started us to worship on Sabbath, um, with eight people, but within four weeks they had more than 20 and it was breaking the law and they started to meet under these orange trees that you can see and in two years, and they've all got orange t-shirts because they're part of the orange small group. You know how big that orange small group is? 160 people. The businessman has built a church on his own land that seats 180 and they fill it up already with all their guests in three years. What do they do? Discovery Bible reading. Very simple. Because, you know, pastors can't be everywhere. And they just, we, we as a church have, have printed and supplied world changer Bibles in the tens of thousands. And Papua New Guinea particularly are like them. And we have trained people. And it happened before COVID. And the Papua New Guinean pastors and people will say, wow, we were trained just in time for COVID. Because we couldn't have big public evangelistic programs. Our churches of 1,000, 200, 100, whatever, couldn't meet. But we all got together with our Bibles and our families. And in their society, they call it one talks, one language. And they just started to read the Bible and ask a chapter at a time and ask these basic questions. Kids started to find it interesting because their points of view were valued. Um, Neighbours were going, hey, what's happening? Because the, 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 the children and the adults were inviting their, their friends. Here you can see one of the groups in one part of Papua New Guinea all out with their Bibles and doing a Bible discovery Group. Now, sometimes in some of the cultures, they have men in one group, women in another, and um, kids and whatever in another, but in others, it's all in to, together. This is in another town, and you can see they're all actually holding just a portion of Scripture. All of these guys are a part of a gang that used to terrorise one part of a city in Papua New Guinea. The local people fed them and said, do you guys read? And I said, yeah, we're all high school dropouts. They don't want to go back to the village, but they can't find a job. And so how do they survive with crime? Well, the crime rate has dropped because they're all in a Bible discovery group. And, and you can see they've got their... Um, their little scriptures, which is, I think have got three books of the Bible um, in them, and they're going through it, and it's making an incredible difference in their life. There you can see the world change of Bibles. There you see one of the women's groups doing that, um, the questions. And things have grown and developed. They said, we want to get it a little bit more deeper and stuff. And so a Papua New Guinean who is now at our division, Pastor Danny Phillips, has uh, created some other questions to help people go a little deeper into their Bible study. And uh, there you have the, the, the questions uh, there which they have um, produced to, to help because during COVID, 6,000 new churches were established through this method. Method. You heard right, 6,000. Just following the power of the gospel with the networks of relationship. 
Kelvin Waikavi is in the middle, he's squatting down. He's a CPA accountant. He is on Pacific Adventist University Council. He's also a member of the Division Executive Committee. Very smart man. He um, contributes very well and he is a financial advisor to a, um, a firm that offers advice for medical services to the Papua New Guinean government. He started and he said, I'm no pastor, but I just took my Bible with my family and they started with eight people and in two years they've got 80 and it's probably the smallest group that I heard of but they've baptised 11 people. And it's amazing what happens. We just went for a walk up in another part of the country and the man with uh, the green thongs on um, he said, do you like my new church? And the district pastor said, yeah. He'd only found out about his, this new church um, a couple of months before and he started it the same way and he's saying, all I want is some copper, which they call roofing iron, corrugated roofing iron. I'm happy to you know, supply everything else. So we've got the General Conference has donated a million US dollars. We've put in 500,000 um, as well and we are now getting as much roofing iron out to the 6,000 new churches all around Papua New Guinea. This lady here uh, was part of a gated village community. During COVID, despite the, the risk to our own health, went around helping all who were sick. That's all she did, just going and helping all that were sick. Not, she, she, she didn't worry about what it may do to her. She had other people finally join her and now she's established a whole new church and local businessmen have, have paid for this new congregation um, and where they meet. Um, this man here lost his job during COVID. Because he lost his job, he couldn't complete his house in a village just outside one of the cities. But he had been trained and had a world changer Bible and he said, all right, well, I've got nothing else to do. I'll just invite my family and friends in the village to come. And now underneath his house, which is un incomplete because he still hasn't got a job, they have about 60 people on a Sabbath, another one of the new churches. Um, the president here, Pastor Luke Nathan, said he found out about this new church that a businessman had built during COVID um, and didn't know anything about it until afterwards. And you can see it's quite, quite an um, interesting place. Last, last story. These guys here told... Th this is in a settlement. In most villages in Papua New Guinea, you're fairly, fairly safe. But a settlement is in a city or near a city and it has people of all kinds of different tribes who come together and live in the one place. It are the, they're the most dangerous parts of Papua New Guinea. I grew up in PNG and I knew. And as we're going in there, I'm seeing some of the spotters you know, for the settlement, young, young guys, and I'm going, are you sure we're going to be okay going in there? Because, you, you know, it's like anywhere. There are places that are safe in every city and some that are not so safe. And they said, no, 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 it's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll be all right. And so we wander on in and then we meet these guys and they're kind of rough-looking looking fellows. But, um, and they take us to this very spot. And I say, why are you taking us here? He said, well, pastor, this is where we used to meet. And we used to drink. We used to smoke. Uh, we used to gamble. And you, we used to prepare and plan our crimes. I go, oh, OK. Fair enough. And they said, but things changed. We know that down the gully and up the other side of the ridge, of the next ridge, is the Seventh-day Adventist church and where the better part of town is. And we used to go over and do stuff there. But one of the businessmen came here to our settlement 
And he cleaned it up with a whole lot of the church people. And these walkways, which were also their drains, he just got cement and cemented them. And he said all of the people in the settlement were so impressed that, that, that they would do that. When he said, you know, do you want anything from it? He said, no, just maybe we could have a Bible discovery reading group. And one of us joined and he came and spoke to the rest of us because we could see things were changing. And the place where we are standing is now our new church. And we meet here during the week to pray to God and prepare and plan our service to the community instead of our crimes and we worship here every Sabbath that's the power of oikos and Acts in two places says something like this and every day in the temple and from house to house they didn't see teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus and Paul says, how I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and from teaching you in the public and from house to house. The power of the three places, the home, the work, and the third place, and de developing influence and oikos through the power of the gospel to pull people together. May God bless one Turner as you venture in this.